Good, good day. We're well, well, welcoming you to America Stands for Thursday, December the 3rd, 2020. It's post-election uh, news coverage in the spirit of faith. Uh, election day was over four weeks ago, and we're still keeping you informed daily. The reason why is because information with the anointing is brings it? great power. That's exactly With me today right. is Tim Fox. My good friend is right here next to me. We were laughing as we were coming on the air because you're talking about the studio being cold today. Yeah, I was not born to live in cold weather, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't think. Or maybe I missed my calling, I don't know. And uh, I'm comfortable, so <laughs> it's, it's kind of like we're a married couple here in a weird sort of way. Wow. Okay, that was too far. <laughs> uh, so Tim's with me. Representative Stephanie Borowitz from Pennsylvania is uh, with us today as well. You'll want to uh, stay tuned for her. She is the representative from Pennsylvania 76. Listen, she was on the uh, panel that uh, Rudy Giuliani was on. And so we want to make sure we speak to her today and get some insight about what happened there. So we want to welcome her to today's program. Uh, Representative Borowitz, are you with us? Are you there? I'm with you. There she is. <laughs> so glad to see you. You were on that panel last week during uh, the hearing with Rudy Giuliani and Trump legal team. Before we get to those details, let me give you a little recap of what's happened in Pennsylvania. All right, here's the timeline. September the 17th, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court unlawfully and unilaterally extended the deadline by which mail-in ballots could be received. They mandated that ballots without a postmark would be treated as timely and allowed for ballots without a verified voter signature to be accepted. Then on October the 23rd, upon a petition from the Secretary of the Commonwealth, Kathy Bookvart, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled that signatures on mail-in ballots need not be authenticated. On November the 2nd, this is right before the election day, the Secretary of the Commonwealth encouraged certain counties to notify party and candidate representatives of mail-in voters whose ballots contained defects. She then certified the state's election results on November 24th. So is that within her power or should that have been the legislature that did that? Uh, Stephanie, is that, is well, that according her? To, according to the statutes, uh, you know, and I believe it was 1937 that we changed that it goes towards the popular vote um, and kind of takes it out of the hand of the legislature um, and puts it into the hands of the secretary of state. But I believe the supremacy clause applies here in article two in the US constitution um, that it's still, if you look at Supreme Court cases, uh, that they always have favored that it's in the hands of the state legislature. Um, so I believe, you know, in the end, it's still in the hands of the state legislature and the Supreme Court cases have always um, validated that, okay. uh, that it's in our hands ultimately. Okay, so let's bring you up to speed on the next thing on the timeline. The day before Thanksgiving, November 24th, a hearing was held to review irregularities with the mail-in voting system and address voter concerns. You were there, you were on the panel. Yeah. A poll observer, Justin Queter, testified that Philadelphia Board of Elections processed hundreds of thousands of mail-in ballots with zero civilian oversight or observation <laughs> due to a fence that was keeping observers at least 50 feet away from the things that were being counted. In addition to that, the Board of Elections came up with a duplication process for ballots that machines couldn't read. The workers individually filled in the ballots with no observation to that. So your session of the legislature ended on November 30th and you will not meet again until January 7th of 2021. Is that correct? That is correct. And I was at that hearing. Um, and like I was telling you, it was eye opening. Um, we had so okay. many people uh, testifying as to being kicked out. They weren't allowed to be in poll watching, uh, mm -hmm. cured ballots in Democrat counties and not in Republican counties. Um, and just numerous things. I mean, the inconsistencies of uh, 2.5 million counted mail-in ballots on the Department of State website, and that completely is was gone and taken mm -hmm. off. Okay, so um, I have, I have that. I have that right here. Yeah. I wrote this down. I wanted to ask you that. Do we know how many mail-in ballots were sent out in Pennsylvania? Okay, so at the hearing, it said that we sent out about 1.8 million mail-in ballots. But on the Department of State website, it said 2.5 million had been counted. Um, so that's a huge discrepancy right there. Well, that's the, um, that's so the margin this, of the win. <laughs> if I'm doing my math right. Exactly. 
exactly. So um, that was eye opening. And I mean, we had times and moments there. I know a lot of the news media, well, the, a lot of the news media wouldn't even show this hearing. And actually, Senator Mastriano's Twitter account was uh, completely taken off after showing mm -hmm. this hearing. Um, and so it was eye opening and people really almost gasped when they heard what was going on and, and, and the truth that was being revealed in this hearing. You and so it was very eye opening for state legislators and good thing for us to be there and sit and hear the truth. You mentioned Senator Doug Mastriano. Um, he chaired that hearing and he's called what happened in Pennsylvania a constitutional crisis. Do you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why the House, the state house wrote a resolution saying that this election was in dispute. And then he uh, wrote one very similar in the uh, Senate, um, from the Senate side and the Senate perspective to actually change the electors. And so it's um, absolutely, we're in a constitutional crisis in this. And like you were saying before, we did end our session November 30th. Uh, so we didn't have enough calendar days to run the resolution, but we reintroduced it in the new, uh, t you know, new session that's coming up now but we're running into a problem that the PA Constitution tells us that the governor shall call us into only an emergency session in the month of December. Um, but it, the, the key thing, like I was telling you before, is that it sh he shall call us into session, an emergency session, if there's a majority of legislators um, requiring it. And so um, that's going to be hard to do because Governor Wolf has not obviously sided along with anything constitutional, nor the PA Supreme Court or the Secretary of State. Okay. Um, so that's kind of, uh, you know, it's hitting a roadblock there. So do you have a majority? I mean, because uh, of legislators that would re require him to do that? I mean, uh, you know, we have a, 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 a great group that's been working on this resolution. It's about 40, I'd say, to 50 of us. Um, we'd have to get more on, on board. Okay. Um, but I believe that we could have the majority of state Republican legislators, you know, to say that this election is in dispute and we cannot send the electors uh, with what we're hearing in the, in the truth that's coming out. OK, so here's here's the reason I asked that, because we're hearing of different places where not all the Republicans are together or unified in this. Um, and I'm not going to throw one of your colleagues under the bus. One of our viewers wrote a letter to her representative or, or senator, I can't recall at this time, and, and I won't mention the name, but I have a copy of that letter that he sent back to her, and he is a Republican, but boy, it sure didn't sound like he was interested in this, uh, in this process. So I didn't know if everybody was in agreement or if, or if it's a small group or, or just where we stand. I'm trying to get an answer for the people where we stand in Pennsylvania. Yeah, no, it's not, everyone's not in agreement. Um, and it's disheartening a little bit. And, yeah, you know, I view everything through the lens of freedom and liberty, and I would hope that other state legislators also do. Um, but a lot of time people are there as politicians um, to make sure that their seat remains. To me, I've been placed there by the people in my district to make sure that freedom remains, that liberty remains, that truth and justice um, is still there for the people. It's the whole reason why I'm there. I told, I had a call with someone after we had a, a caucus call and I said, listen, I've been like this since I was a little girl fighting for the things that I believe in. I go, you're not changing me now. I'm not here for a political position. I'm here to defend and uphold our liberties and fight for them and for the people in my area and the whole Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. That's so, the difference between, unfortunately, yeah. yeah. That's the difference between a politician and a statesman right there. Politicians thinking about their next election statements, a statesman's what's best for the people, even if I don't get reelected because I took a stand. And we thank you for, for doing that. Um, so as we go forward here with Pennsylvania and you were in that hearing, let me just ask you this. Are you convinced that something happened that's not right in that election in Pennsylvania? Based on what I heard in that hearing, something is not right. And I was convinced of that. And not just myself, but so many other legislators were convinced of that through hearing the truth. And it's sad that we're living in a time when the media doesn't want the truth out. So no one, it's, it's hard. You know, we have God's truth and God's word because right now the media doesn't want us to hear the truth. And it was clear that day. Uh, and not just to me, like I said, but to other legislators. And so, yes, I was fully convinced that there was meddling in this election. Um, and it needs to be looked into. There needs to be justice brought. Um, and, um, you know, that's why we held the line and wrote this resolution in the State House of Pennsylvania. And I believe other states are doing that also. 
Yeah, we talked about Arizona yesterday, and I, I want to officially thank you on behalf of all the people that watch this program yeah. for what you did and what you continue to do. And we invite you, we got to cover a few other things here. I'd love to invite you to stay with us. And if you want to jump in and, and uh, sound off on anything, please, please do so. Uh, but thank sure. you very much. Thanks. All right. Our first truly social media president took to Facebook on Wednesday to share a few thoughts on the election of voter fraud with the American people. Uh, here's what some of President Trump had to say. This may be the most important speech I've ever made. I want to provide an update on our ongoing efforts to expose the tremendous voter fraud and irregularities which took place during the ridiculously long November 3rd elections. We used to have what was called Election Day. Now we have election days, weeks and months, and lots of bad things happened during this ridiculous period of time especially when you have to prove almost nothing to exercise our greatest privilege, the right to vote. As President, I have no higher duty than to defend the laws and the Constitution of the United States. That is why I am determined to protect our election system, which is now under coordinated assault and siege. So the president called for a full forensic audit of mail-in ballots from some of the battleground states. I can understand why. We just revealed to you Pennsylvania, 1.8 million sent out, 2.5 came back. He also says determined to protect our election system that he is now uh, under a coordinated assault. I absolutely agree with that because you yeah. see the media and, and, and everybody. Tim? You know, you said the first line that you mentioned in that story, you said our first truly social media president, which is absolutely the truth, but he's had to become that because that's the only way he's been able to get his message out. Okay. Uh, he, he can't get his message out, obviously, through the mainstream media. He has to get it out through social media, and he's gotten criticized for it. But I think that's one of the many things about him that make him special because he's not a politician. What we were talking about before, he's not a politician. He's not worried about the next election. Now, he's concerned about what's going on in the nation now because he sees how evil it is. But uh, he, it, it, he's not concerned about the election. Look at your children and your grandchildren. Take yeah, a look in their face. That's right. And realize what, what they're facing. That's right. If we don't get this right. right. If you listen to the mainstream media, there is no yeah. evidence of widespread election fraud. That's been the patent line used since November 3rd by both the mainstream media and many in the Democratic Party. Uh, it's something that they've said over and over and over again. But that may be about to change. Uh, in Nevada, a courtroom today, lawyers representing the president will, re will present their case that they say will show proof of widespread election fraud in the state. We're not talking about hundreds of ballots or even tens of thousands. Campaign lawyers are expected to show that more than 100,000 fraudulent ballots were cast in the November 3rd election. And that would be more than three times the amount needed to overturn Joe Biden's win and give Nevada's electoral college votes to President Trump. According to the Federalist, among the allegations expected to be made today in Carson City, Nevada courtroom include 42,000 voters voted twice, 1,500 dead people voted, and tens of thousands of people registered to vote with non-residential addresses, including vacant or non-existent addresses. And some are even reportedly from out of state, Greg. And Obviously, all of those are illegal. <laughs> right, exactly. I've got all of my little notes. This yeah. is my Thanksgiving notebook here that I, I, during the Thanksgiving break, I was reading through some things and I, I was looking at the incredible job that Joe Biden did. His numbers are lower than Hillary Clinton's 2016 numbers in every major city in the United States, except for Milwaukee, Detroit, Atlanta, and Stephanie, here we go, Philadelphia. Of course. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, of sorry course. to do that to you. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, that's not surprising. Um, and I wanted to add in that I think there was around 30,000 mail-in ballots in Pennsylvania that said they were returned and counted on the same day that they were mailed out to the people. And so it's just, what? <laughs> these, what? these are the kind of things we heard wait, in the wait. hearing. They were mailed to the house. They filled it out. I guess they made the, the mail person set right there. Wait right here. I want to fill this out, and that's, then I'm going to give it right that's back called, to you. That's called Uber mail. <laughs> right. <laughs>
<laughs> wow. That's something. All right. Uh, we told we told you about this yesterday. We told you about an undercover investigation from Project Veritas, reportedly conducted over two months of CNN news meetings by them. Uh, well, now some of the hearings, uh, we're hearing some of what was being said in the CNN meetings. Here is CNN President Jeff Zucker in mid-October seeming to instruct the staff to downplay the New York Post bombshell story about what was found on Hunter Biden's laptop. Listen to this. The Hunter Biden story was an explosive blow against Joe Biden leading up to the presidential election. But listen on this 9 a.m. editorial conference call at CNN how President Jeff Zucker chooses to not cover this important story. I think uh, on the Breitbart, New York Post, Fox News, rabbit hole of Hunter Biden, which I don't think anybody outside of that world understood last night, the Wall Street Journal reported that uh, their review of all corporate records so showed no role for Joe Biden uh, on, the, um, uh, uh, on the Chinese deal. And yes, I do put more credibility in the Wall Street Journal than I do in the New York Post. Um, obviously, uh, we're not going with the uh, New York Post story uh, right now on Hunter Biden, and uh, which seems to be uh, giving its marching orders to Fox News and the right-wing echo chamber about what to uh, talk about today. Obviously, Hunter Biden's lawyer is quoted in that New York uh, Post piece, and we'll just continue to report out this is the very stuff that the president was impeached over. This is the stuff that Senate committees looked at and found nothing wrong in uh, Joe Biden's uh, interactions uh, with Ukrainians and and uh, now having an email that uh, perhaps there was a meeting with someone uh, from Burisma is, uh, uh, it seems, uh, Rudy Giuliani's sort of dream of vision of, of how to throw stuff at the wall. So there are some of the meeting notes that uh, you're hearing. A big part of the story was an email found on the laptop where a top, a top executive with the Ukrainian energy company Burisma thanked Hunter for arranging a meeting with his dad, Joe who was then the vice president of the United States. Listen, if this election continues the way it is, there's so much things. We, we heard a report, uh, David Barton told us about a report that Democrats were polled and said had they known that story, 17% of them would have not voted for Joe Absolutely Biden. true. And that's, that just tells you how suppressive they are in the mainstream media with information. And I think it's funny to hear Zucker use the word echo chamber when talking about uh, Fox News and other places thinking that they are not that. I mean, that the, the self-awareness is an issue with these people, by the way, so you shouldn't be surprised, I guess. Also yesterday, we updated you on everything in Arizona. Representative Fincham told us about the sample of ballots. The Arizona GOP took a random sample of 100 ballots to be investigated. According to the Arizona Congressman Paul Gosser, one Trump vote was just not counted and another was taken away from Trump and given to Biden. That shows a margin of fraud to help Biden of 3%. Now, yesterday we thought it was about 2%. Now, as the president tweeted, if those numbers hold true to a larger sample, he would have gotten about 90,000 more votes and easily have won that state. Now, a judge has reportedly ordered a larger audit. We'll keep you posted, of course, and also in Arizona, on Wednesday, attorney Sidney Powell filed a lawsuit, a pro-Trump suit. According to the Washington Times, the suit alleges Dominion voting systems, we've heard that before, created security risk and statistical anomalies in the November election. It calls out supposed software manipulation along with other fraud. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so we're going to stop the steal, right? We're, yes. we're doing that in Georgia yes. as well. A stop the steal rally was held in Georgia yesterday. Attorney Sidney Powell and Lynn Wood were both on hand to get the crowd fired up. Take a look at this. I want you to go to the governor's mansion. I want you to circle it. I want you to blow your horns until Brian Kemp comes out and orders a special session of the Georgia legislature. Get us our legislature and tell everybody we want our legislator to meet and we want him to fix the mess that he created. This is the battle between good and evil. This is the battle between truth and lies. This election was a fraud on America. Donald Trump won a May massive landslide victory unparalleled in the history of this country and he's going to stay in the white house because we the people voted for him and we the people run this country 
Sounds to me like he's calling for a Jericho march there around the, <laughs> around the Capitol. Uh, Representative Borkowitz, maybe that's what you need. Maybe you need to get a bunch of, of people with trumpets to walk around the, uh, the Capitol there or the governor's we mansion. Actually have had, we've actually had people walking around the Pennsylvania Capitol and praying. It's pretty neat. That's wonderful. It's pretty neat. Wow. Both yeah. Wood and Powell said they're going to fight to make sure the truth gets out about the election. Today, the Georgia Senate is holding hearings on election issues right there in that state. So that's what an option that you can be praying about. Yeah, and Greg, there's also a report circulating out there that we haven't been able to verify yet that uh, Powell and uh, the other folks there are telling people not to vote in Georgia as a protest. I don't know if they've actually said that, but if they did, I'll just ignore that. You need to vote. <laughs> if you're in Georgia, you need to vote. There's nothing to keep you from going out and voting uh, in that runoff election. We wanted to share with you again uh, about an event happening this weekend in Georgia as they're heading into that Senate runoff election. It's called Barnstorm Georgia. It is led by our friend Rick Green, and of course, David and Tim Barton from Wall Builders. Uh, they're hosting events about the state campaigning for around the state campaigning for the restoration of biblical values and constitutional principles and encouraging people of faith to become biblical citizens. Special guests include Kirk Cameron, uh, Michelle Bachman, our own Michelle Bachman, Kirk, uh, Charlie Kirk, and many more. Go to barnstormgeorgia.com for more information on oh, there that. There you go. We've had people call us and say, what can we do? How can we help in Georgia? We've told them, don't move there so you can vote. That's illegal. And we, we've told them that you can pray and that you can go knock on doors and there are things that you can do. But, uh, but voting outside, not being a Georgia resident and, and legal, we, we don't tell you to do that, even though Hollywood tells people to do that. All right, here we go. A bipartisan pandemic uh, relief bill seems to have a good chance of passing and ending months of congressional gridlock. Of course, it's past the election now. The uh, $908 billion bill was introduced earlier this week by Democratic Senator Mark Warner of Virginia and Republican Senator Mitt Romney of Utah. As the UPI reports, the measure includes $288 billion to help small business and $180 billion for extended unemployment benefits. Both Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and Senate Majority Minority Leader sorry, Chuck Schumer said that they will support this. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he believes the framework of the bill is a good starting point for negotiations. So once again, we've got a little bit of gridlock happening. All the while, they keep telling you shut businesses don't yeah. don't uh, closing <laughs> closing down the economy matter of fact if we've got this clip uh, we have some breaking we have some breaking news uh, that just happened while we were live here uh, from the uh, county of los angeles the mayor of los angeles made a very bold statement and he's uh, he just said cancel everything here's part of his statement my message couldn't be simpler it's time to hunker down it's time to cancel everything, and if it isn't essential, don't do it. Don't meet up with others outside your household. Don't host a gathering. Don't attend a gathering. And following our targeted safer at home order, if you're able to stay home, stay home. Okay, that's the uh, yeah. mayor of Los Angeles. I would add one more don't to that. Don't comply. <laughs> All right. I, I, I see Stephanie. I see you, Stephanie, uh, you nodding your head there. What's yeah, going on? I was, was going to say, hey, can I say something on that yeah, one? Go I, ahead. I have to agree. I have to agree. Do not comply. I, I watched a video last night almost in tears, and it was live uh, at a restaurant in New York City. And there was a lot of people there, and they're saying, we're not going to take this anymore. Uh, we're not going to shut down our restaurants. Uh, we're not going to comply. And just fighting the good fight, doing what I wrote my friends last night. And they said, okay, I showed them the clip of that. And I said, we're doing what Americans do. We fight back. We stand up for what's right and what we believe in. This is all about control now. This is all about control. And we better start fighting it now before it gets really bad. Um, and we already seen it, it getting really bad. I mean, eight months into it. And he just said, cancel everything, cancel everything. Um, and so it's, it's, should, be eye-opening to us, and I completely agree. Do not comply. Well, we and I can't that. believe I even have to say that. <laughs> yeah, I watched that in uh, Staten Island last night in New York, yeah. um, as thousands of people gathered outside. the The sheriff's department was barricading off this man's establishment, and yet, just a few blocks away, things are open. It's because of the color zones or whatever, and. Uh, 
I don't know how we got to this place. I think we got to this place, Stephanie, because in good faith, you know, Christians follow the rules. In good faith, we, we listen to them when they said, I think it was 15 days and then extended another 30 days or something like that. But now it's, it's not that. We've even got Fauci saying kids should go back to school when he's don't Absolutely. go to school. And so no one really knows where the science is. But uh, the answer, yep. uh, I don't know what the answer is for us, but it, it's that things like that. It's, it's listen to your spirit and, and begin to stand up and be an American again. That's my opinion. <laughs> Amen. I couldn't agree more. And we have a restaurant here in Pennsylvania, Sons of Italy, um, and they fought back and they won a lawsuit and they're open and um, they fought back and they stood up. And and that's what we have to do as Americans and our freedoms. You're right. It was a 14 day flatten the curve. Well, the curve was flattened, even though we're having a little bit of a, a, a peak right now. Uh, we have to live our lives. We can't live in fear. Um, that's not that's not what we do as Americans. I just read to my kids the other night the six mile trek that the men made to Valley Forge in the middle of the Revolutionary War, and they didn't even have socks on their feet. And um, you know, these are the, this is the high price that was paid for freedom. And so we have to stand up and fight now and do not comply. So it's it's important right as, now. Especially, uh, I, I'm not sure how we got here. Especially in your state where where you um, serve. I think of Valley Forge, I think about all the things, Gettysburg, all the different things that are in that state. We are celebrating, we talked about this yesterday, the 400th anniversary soon this month of the pilgrims landing at Plymouth Rock. And they came here because of religious oppression from a government. And now we're seeing the exact same thing. Here's the thing, there's nowhere that we can get on a boat and sail to now, That's this right. is it. And we have to make the stand here. And there was a flag that was flown, and uh, General Washington flew that flag right there where you were talking about, called Appeal to Heaven. They, ha they had appealed to Parliament, they had appealed to their governors, they had appealed to the Crown, and the last place we have to appeal to is Heaven. And we're kind of, I believe, reached that point, haven't we? We sure have. Um you know, like Ronald Reagan said, this is the last great stand of freedom. You said mm. it perfectly. There is nowhere else to go. This is it. And so that's what I tell my sons. I said, this is why I'm fighting as hard as I am. Freedom's worth fighting for, the freedom that we have in liberty through Jesus. And our, yeah. our liberty bell right there in Independence Hall, it says, proclaim liberty throughout all the land. Oh. Um, so this is it. This is the time for us and our, that Jesus brought us here to live in this time specifically to stand up and fight as they did and the pilgrims that were willing. I put up a picture on my state rep page the other day and it showed uh, the people that came over on the Mayflower and the pilgrims and then the year after when they went through winter and how many lost their lives. There was one, it was just one child was left out of a whole family lineage um, after a hard winter when they came here to this free land. Uh, there's been a great sacrifice paid for us and it's our duty it's our duty to stand up and fight for what's right and what we've mm. been given the bible says the toil and labor of others uh, that came before us and so it's our duty to stand up and fight for what we what we've been given boy well right. stephanie representative stephanie borkwitz thank you so much <laughs> you're the you're the tip of the spear on this i was trying to get you to run for governor coming up in two years but <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that alone for now. Thank you for what you're doing and what you have done. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it yeah, so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Tim. I love what she said uh, early on in this program. She said, look at everything through the lens of freedom and the lens of liberty. That is absolutely the best statement I've heard in some time. And you look at li life, look at this thing through the lens of fr freedom and liberty. Amen. And I know that's what you're doing. I hope we've given you a little hope today. We know how to pray now today, right? So coming up at 5 Eastern, 4 Central time, we'll be here with Victory Update. That's every single weekday. Uh, don't forget America stands uh, every day at noon Eastern, 11 Central. Tonight, Gene Bailey, Hank Kuhneman, Mario Murillo, and Lance Wallnow on Flashpoint. You don't want to miss it. We'll see you this afternoon. God bless, God bless everybody.